everybody, it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Daniel Polani uh, to give us a talk. Today his talk is going to be on information theory for cognitive modelling, speculations and directions. As you know, Daniel gave a keynote in, uh, in the main CNS uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, as Daniel and I discussed, I actually missed it because uh, I was sick and missed a whole day of CNS and haven't caught up on all the uh, and all videos yet. But that's one of the great things about having uh, an online conference that we can go back and watch these videos, which is fantastic. Uh, it's just that I'm going to be watching them in the wrong order now. I'll see this talk before I see the, uh, the, the main keynote. Um, okay, so Daniel's from the University of Hertfordshire. Uh, we know Daniel very well. You, you guys probably heard us chatting in the break just then about uh, what's going on in the A Life community. That's where we know each other from uh, mainly. But uh, today, uh, Daniel will be talking less about our life and more about neuroscience. So over to you, Daniel. Thank you very much. It is a pleasure. And please let me know if you can't hear me. It seems that I seem to cover my micro occasionally. So if that happens, don't be afraid, just interrupt me. Shall do. Okay, so um, as this is a workshop, I decided to take a little bit more experimental approach. Usually I talk about uh, the, big, uh, the big picture of the field and the uh, techniques and established techniques. Today I talk a little bit more about speculations. I permit myself to be a bit more wild and um, I'm throwing a mixed bag at you of ideas that I think are worth considering, worth spending time on. And um, let me um, start as always with uh, acknowledgements. This is essentially the same list as uh, in my main talk. There are so many people involved in the research that and the list is getting longer it's simply uh, um, many people uh, communities work right so we really have to understand that um, without that it wouldn't work so I I like to mention all these uh, people involved especially in this case because uh, I'll talk about that Christoph Sager uh, Sander van Dijk um, um, uh, Alexander Klubin, who uh, with whom uh, basically the whole uh, idea, or the whole the whole um, direction um, was started. Um, Alexander Klubin is here somewhere. Must be. He's well, on the list. He's, he's on the list anyway. He must be on the list anyway. That, so yeah. uh, and Tom Anthony, I will mention later too. Right. So essentially. Um, the more you know, the more you know you don't know. And this is truer in information theory than in any other field, probably. Um, many years ago, when I was a PhD student, actually, I met. Covering the mic, Daniel. There we Can go. you we're hear back. me now? Yeah, we're yeah. back. So, so he, he, he said, um, uh, what are you going to do now that you got your PhD? And I said, well, I'm going to look at uh, in, information theory. And he said, information theory? But that field is dead already. That's a long time ago, right? So we see that um, that's not, not quite true. As, as you start delving more into it, things change. So... I'm going to start with something that, of course, Joe has, uh, um, his heart is beating a lot for that, and it's a really cool area. And I, I call it portioning information. And there's this nice quote um, by Philip Mirowski. Shannon's theory of information has set in motion one of the most farcical trains of misconceptions, namely that information is a palpable thing with sufficient integrity to be measured and parceled out. Well. I don't agree with this quote at all, but I think it should be stated. So people don't think that you can't treat information as a thing to handle, handle, to separate, to add, to compound. And of course, other people did agree. And of course, one of the big steps ahead in the question of how to actually treat information as a quantity to be parceled out is the discovery of the information lattice by Williams and Baer. Um, they formulated the problem said, if you have such a lattice, then you should be able to actually al allocate contributions by different parts, which are actually far finer grain than what we usually do with a coarse uh, grain Venn diagram. 
this was an absolutely ingenious idea and uh, it has kickstarted a huge top uh, huge activity in the topic it's not a large community but it is a very active community and i would just mention of course uh, joe joe's work um uh, Ryan James and uh, Jim Crutchfield and Niels Batchinger and uh, basically the crowd from the Max Planck Institute in Leipzig, Nihat I, of course, Jürgen Joost, Ernst Albrecht and all. And um, also um, my group has done some contribution in the field. And it turns out that what people usually do, they formulate actions and then they try to fulfill them. But these actions, many of you who work in the field know that, um, are not all compatible. So you formulate very natural axioms and it turns out they're not compatible. What's worse, and that's my personal view on it, um, I, I would not say that the community agrees on that, as many of these axioms seem not a priori, but a posteriori. You build something that behaves somehow nicely and then you think, oh yeah, this is actually an axiom in itself. Covering the mic again, Daniel. You can't hear me? There we go. We're, we're back now. Yeah, I, I don't know. The microphones must be in the strange location. Um, <laughs> so essentially, um, these axioms may be um, not a priori, but a posteriori. So there's ambiguity in purposes and goals. What is a decomposition, redundancy, synergy, etc., going to measure? And there's a reason why we have so much differing opinions about that. And um, Perhaps it's good, it makes it a very live field, it's, it's a very active field. But I want today to speculate a bit why that may be the case. Why do we have a, actually a problem in this field? And I take a route that's not so, I, I haven't seen it so much discussed in this community and I hope to open a vigorous discussion on that. So, um, Raymond Jung, um, roughly two decades from now, um, he discovered something very specific. I want to explain what it is. It's a little bit formal. I'll, I'll try to, to make it uh, as transparent as I can. So when you do Shannon information, you know all these uh, nice Venn diagrams. Uh, so basically, um, each of these circles, that's the entropy of X, say, that's the entropy of Y, that's the entropy of a Z, and then you have the, the Venn diagram where they overlap, that's a mutual information, and when you take something out, you condition on that, so X, um, information of X and Y, given Z is basically what X and Y shares, and if you eat out, if you take a bite out of Z. So that's how you write the Venn diagram, and we do know that some of these entries are non-negative, but some of them are, are not guaranteed to be non-negative. Some of them can have two signs, like the center. So this was the thing that uh, irked Williams and Bayer. Um, but for now, let's have a look at the nature of this cont of these these um, of these entries. So for this, we are looking at random variables x1 to xn. Let's call that theta. And we choose a subset of indices thereof. So v is a subset of them. So we pick a subset. And now we consider the entropy of V. Basically, I write that is simply the entropy of the random variables that are subsumed under this index. So for example, X and Y, or X and Z, or X, or X and Y and Z, or Y and Z, etc. And we just agree that the entropy of the empty set is simply zero. Um, that's just a convention. So essentially, we are not interested. Uh, the entropy of the empty set is that. So we can now, for a given set of random variables and a given set of indices, define some kind of entropy. This is a value. And for every set, you get a different value. And this has some interesting properties. They're called polymatroidal axioms. Let's not worry about this word, a complicated word. Um, it's a math mathematical axiom. It's a nice structure that appears in math a lot. So the empty set is zero. If um, you have a, a set that is co containing V, its entropy is also non-decreasing. Uh, non and then this final, this property, this is a submodularity, is basically um, the set theoretical analog of concavity. So if you grow the set, essentially, the, it, it is 
um, um, uh, it reduces in added value. So essentially uh, diminishing returns as you make the set larger and larger. That's basically this property. Now, if we look at all entropies, entropy, conditional entropy, mutual information, conditional mutual information, they are all non-negative. Okay, so they cut out of the possible values that these entropies, let me go a slide back, the, these entropies could have, they cut out all the ones that could be negative. So we look at the, the collective of all the entropies for all the sets, all the subsets, we know they're non-negative, and we also know the mutual information, which are combinations of entropies, they can be shown to be combinations of entropies, they are non-negative too. So there are certain, certain rules that we know are fulfilled. So let us now write a vector. The vector H is the collection of all the entropy values for all the possible subsets. So every combination of x1, x2, x3, x4, xn, in any possible subset, forget the empty set, that's, a, that's always zero, so we don't care. Um, every combination of that, we look at that and we look at its entropy value for some given, for, uh, and, and we collect them in a vector. This is a vector that is two to the n minus one dimensional. The minus one that comes because we, uh, the empty set uh, doesn't add anything. We have kicked it out. Right, and now let's look at the ones, and I go back to the Venn diagram. The, the, the Venn diagram is this diagram that says, this is non-zero, this is non-negative, uh, this is non-negative, this is non-negative, non et cetera. All the non-negative ones we know, these are all the non-negative um, quantities we know, and they define the cut of possible values for the H. And keep in mind that mutual information, conditional mutual information, conditional entropy can all be computed by a linear combination of pure entropies. Pure entropies are these things. Pure entropies are entropies of combinations of the variables we looked at. We can always compute all the quantities below as a linear combination thereof. So this is a linear, um, uh, non, uh, linear inequality. And all these linear inequalities we know from Shannon, that's known for 70 years, essentially. If it satisfies the Shannon inequalities, we say this vector is gamma, is belonging in gamma n. Right. Now the question is, and we only realized, and actually the, 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 this was following a paper from the 80s, that not all of gamma n necessarily needs to be generated by actual probabilities. So if I actually give you random variables, real the random variables with real probabilities, can I generate the whole of gamma n? Well, this is an interesting question. So let's call the set gamma n star. It's a set of all vectors where h is entropic. So basically it's generated by some random variable combination. Any random variable combination can generate, we're considering all random variable combinations and all the h you can consider. Now, it turns out in the case of two variables, it's easy. Gamma 2 star is gamma 2. That's great. That's so basically in the two cases, Shannon inequalities are the inequalities describe your system. That's it. The case of three, it's not as obvious anymore. Gamma 3 star is not equal to gamma 3. However, you take its closure, so you basically take all the limits, then it still becomes the same. So this is still kind of okay. But when we go to four, nasty things happen. The closure of gamma four star is not anymore gamma four. In other words, the Shannon inequalities are not completely describing that set. And if you have an entropy inequality, FH, we say now it is, it is valid only if this gamma star is, is a subset of this, of the H's defined by this inequality. And we are at this stage only interested in linear ones, but you can also look at nonlinear ones. Now, what happens there? It turns out there are lots of linear non Shannon inequalities. I mean, lots. You know the scene in Matrix where they say lots of weapons. Well, there are lots of them. In fact, so many you can't actually, they're not finite. There are infinitely many of them. So 
what I am going to suggest is that maybe one reason that we have such problems with defining a well-defined notion of decomposition, partial information decomposition, and there's disagreements which axioms should be used, is because you can't actually write down a finite set of linear inequalities that would guarantee you all the properties you would like to have. Don't forget, a Mobius transformation, the Mobius transformation, this is all linear. You, you want a linear transformation and you want quantities to be non-negative and so on, and turns out, well, there are infinitely many inequalities this thing um, uh, respects. So I want to suggest that the decomposition um, community starts, PID community starts looking at this question of non shannonian inequalities and its links uh, uh, to decompositions. And I would, uh, to, to encourage you to do that, I would like to mention that there are links to lattices um, of this of this um, non shannon inequalities. There are interesting links to common information. Of course, that sounds, well, suspiciously similar to redundancy. Um, and there are links between common information modeling and uh, non shannon inequalities. Uh, people have now recently started to look at causal modeling. Of course, um, nobody really likes to say that, but the elephant in the room in, in PI PID is, of course, causal modeling. Unique information makes the biggest sense for causal modeling. If you can't identify unique information, you can identify causes. And uh, finally, um, there seems to be also interesting links between um, non-channel inequalities and information geometry. So what I, I'm actually going to encourage you and the community is have to have a look at can non-channel inequalities tell us something about PID? how to design PID or why it's not possible to design PID in a consistent way, simply because it's not available, the, the structure you need is not there. But there are other structures that may be offering something instead. So this is one topic and I said, um, as I said, we have a mixed bag, so I'm skipping completely the topic. Um, from a very speculative part from, to something that where we talk a little bit about more, more concrete results. But again, I'd like to speculate that information theory is a good friend um, when it comes to making informed predictions about cognition and how cognition is organized. So I am now going to talk about goals. I'm not going to do the full introduction of um, our model. Um, but please do um, signal, um, Joe perhaps can, can signal to me if somebody uh, has a concrete question on that. Um, uh, I, I'm happy to explain uh, two or three more things if necessary. So here is a quote. Um, you, you see, I like movies. Uh, Bruce Lee said, a goal is not always meant to be reached, as it often serves simply as something to aim at. Um, again, the, the quote is actually more true than, than it seems at the stage. You will see hopefully later why I'm, I'm saying that. So um, in my keynote, uh, I was talking about agents modeled by uh, perception action loops, a Bayesian network. And the idea was that we would look at uh, how much information they would process as they take decisions as they pick actions in order to get to a goal. Now, let's change the task slightly. So we have a world, and uh, simplified, I assume there's a sensor that in principle can access the whole world, so I call the world just S, um, and a sensor affects action, action affects the state at the next state, and which also, of course, depends on its history, and so on, and so on. So this is a perception action loop, but we now, in addition, consider multiple goals. So we consider that there is um, one random variable that's selected ahead of time. So it's a, an ensemble of, of possible uh, worlds. And the G, the goal, is selected ahead of time. And an action now depends on the state in which you are, of course, but also on the goal. right? And the goal is fixed for the run. So there's one goal in the run and multiple actions. Right, so I can now ask the following question. When I'm choosing an action, how much 
do I need to keep in mind about the current goal as I choose my action? And th this is how you have to think. That, let's say I want to travel to Melbourne. And this is my goal. Very specific location in Melbourne. One particular spot in Melbourne. And to get there, I this is a very, very large number of bits. But in fact, if I were now to get up and go there, I would not need the full information. For the next decision, I all need to do, know is I have to get up. The next step is I have to go through the door. The next step, I have to get a cab to the airport, etc., etc. So essentially, of the goal, of the detailed logistical information to reach to the goal, I need only a very small fraction at each decision. And this is what we are interested in. And we are going to call this goal-relevant information. So the goal-relevant information is information the current action needs about the goal, the minimum current information the action needs about the goal, given that I'm in current uh, state S. This is what I'm looking at. So what do I need right now? Think of it as working memory. What do you need in your working memory to make the next action? Working memory is essentially what we are comparing it with, right? This is the closest thing in neuroscience that this is probably to be linked at. Of course, um, more experiments would be needed to link it. How do we get it? Um, we do it in the usual way, Lagrangian. So we average over the states, of course, uh, because we consider all possible starting states. Uh, the mutual information between action and goal. Um, um, we optimize the value. So we want to pick an optimal route or new optimal route, and we minimize all the possible strategies. So um, when you just compute it over the world, you notice um, this is a world, uh, the blue, uh, dark, very dark blue is a wall. So here we see walls, and there are little, little doors in the walls. There's a door, door, door. Unfortunately, everything is the same color, so it's harder to distinguish. But what you can see is the darker areas, darker shaded areas, are, have a higher goal relevant information. So a corner like here is very light because you don't need much information. In most cases, you just have to go away from the corner anyway, right? You don't need goal relevant information. Most likely, you have to move somewhere. Um, in the in the darker areas, this is what I call a highway. This is where you really need to retain a relatively lot of goal relevant information. It's like moving on a motorway, and you have to decide when to leave the motorway, right? And in the center, it's more than in, in the boundaries because it's more likely that you have to move in the, to the center anyway, right? So the information is higher if, if, if you really don't know what you need to do. If it's more likely that you know what to do, then the information is lower. But now we want to ask a little bit more. We want to ask not only how much of the goal relevant information matters, but actually which goal relevant information is retained. So we are going to uh, um, do it the following way. We are going to mo model what have we done in the past. This is accessible history context. So think the se sequence of actions up to the a t minus one, and now we look at the what I call the cash fetch. So the goal relevant information that you have in your working memory, you need in your working memory, which is not already there. And the way we model it is simply because the world is uh, noise free. So the past is perfectly determining where I have been. So the history is fully containing everything that I've done. So we ask what is information that the new action needs about the goal? that is not already contained in my history. This is the cash fetch. It's the fresh information I need. And when I look at that, I can get this diagram. This is a fresh goal information. And you see that it is darkest at the doors. And now this is goes in two directions because it doesn't care about the direction. So if you go through the door, then it turns out you have some goal uh, information fetched, new inf information, relatively little. When you cross the door, suddenly you have to get new information. Because once you get through the door, you have reached the sub goal, if you like. And when you cross the sub goal, okay, what next? What's the next step? So you leave the house, you close the door behind you, and then you have to decide, okay, what's the next step? You have now to pick 
fresh information about the major uh, of the, of the um, overall goal to make your next decision. It goes in both directions, and you notice it's very very dominant in the doors and very low everywhere else except perhaps in the centers of the rooms where you have to make a, a highway decision. So when you get to the center of the room again, you have to decide: Do I continue or do I I, I take a, a, a right a right move? But the mo most prominent ones are things that we normally would consider sub goals. Now, in AI, usually sub goals are hard to find. Uh, people say, decide this is a goal, and it should be a sub goal. They have to define criteria. And now there's a movement to get rid of this. Now, perhaps don't have to get rid of this. Sub goals are things that humans naturally do. Segmentation is done naturally by humans and animals. So the question is, is it perhaps just a property of working memory? So in other words, the fact that your working memory is very limited, is that perhaps a reason why you simply do a cash fetch at a, at a sub goal? So a sub goal is simply a place where it's most convenient to override your past information with fresh one. In other words, sub goals emerge. Let me make another um, little uh, speculation. Here we look at the discarded information. So the discarded information is information you forget, right? And it turns out again, at the doors, you forget uh, the most information. Yeah, there are other locations where you can forget information, but at the door, you seem to really forget a lot about what has, uh, hap uh, has happened before because you don't need that anymore for your goal. So this discarded information means that when you cross a door, maybe there's a chunk of stuff you forget. Interestingly, we uh, we uh, saw this effect already in 2011, and um, at that time we didn't write it yet in the paper. We only wrote it there, but we essentially saw this effect. And um, shortly after, there was actually an experiment by psychologists that crossing doors causes forgetting. So if you just get up, go through a door, and forget what what you wanted to fetch. And well, that's perhaps a reason, simply because together with the context, you forget also what you wanted to do. So you you uh, you, you basically by crossing doors, you've thrown uh, out the baby with a bath uh, with a bath water, and uh, therefore the argument is again by looking at information. This is very very abstract information theoretic model. Nevertheless, it may inform us about what type of cognitive dynamics do you expect in a system? So let me just check the time to see how much time I have left. Excellent. Now, I, I would like to uh, mention two more things which are kind of interesting. For example, um, people would like to cluster rooms. How can I say this is a room? Uh, how do I lo uh, cluster location? This can also be done information theoretically, and here is a, a way to do that. So here we have rooms, again, with a goal of information. And what we do is, here's the action we pick, here's the state we pick, and here's the goal that has affected our action too. However, now I introduce a bottleneck. The bottleneck is a variable G1 tilde, and G1 tilde is essentially compression of G, which tries to maintain uh, the information um, about the original goal as much as possible. Um, so basically, um, while extracting as little as possible. So give me the most efficient goal information. How much about the goal do I need to know, do I need to retain to pick my action with, still with the most efficiency? Right, I, th I think I think that the, the so the point is I want to maximize the information that A has about G. This is wrong. This should be the G that A has about G. Uh, I want to keep it keep it high enough while minimize how much this the G tilde takes from G. So in other words, the G this G tilde should be as informative about my my goal as possible without anything else. And naturally, it uh, happens to be exactly that. Code the room. Right, so this is the best you can do: coding the room, saying which room you want to be in. If you have three states in G tilde, you have a group of two, two, and two rooms. Um, if you have six, it actually um, splits it up in six rooms. If it's something in between, it has to make compromises, so it splits the room in these two parts or these two parts. Right, this is a compromise. Uh, 
Now, we were a little bit curious, and uh, Sander um, uh, and, and myself, we, we started to ask the question, okay, are there other interesting bottleneck combinations? So we played around, and some of them were hard to interpret, but this one was a very weird one. So I'll explain that in a second, but it's basically a, a different way of bottlenecking. And I want to highlight one property. So we have here nine rooms. You see the rooms with the uh, uh, darkened walls. And you see here clusters that seem completely to ignore the walls. So they basically look like they have filled this space in total transparency of the walls. It's almost as if they think out of the box. And the question is, what, what is this doing, right? Um, it basically does something that humans are very good at, machines are usually not very good at. I mean, machines tend to say, okay, if I have a, a maze, I try all the ways through the maze. And it is very powerful. It, it outperforms humans if it's fast enough. The problem is with the maze, is it has no concept of saying, what if I could break through this wall? That's not what a machine does. So there's a wall that I expect. I respect this wall. I will just do my search elsewhere. But that's not how humans think. Humans think if I could go through this wall, where would I be? Right? You can't imagine what would happen if I break through the wall. You can't imagine where we would be there. So you have the concept of a room without the obstacles. And um, in my opinion, that's part of the the ability of humans to be creative. Uh, the ability of, of breaking the wall, thinking out of the box, literally. And we see here an effect that seems to indicate that this seems to achieve it. So, so what does it actually do? It groups states together indifferently of the fact that there are walls in between. And note, we don't tell the agent this is a 2D world. We give it just a transition graph. True, the transition graph has north, east, south, west. And you need this coherence, but this is a coherence an agent has in the real world. Also, a robot has that. The states have a certain coherence throughout the geometry of the world. Yeah. So, but we'd never tell the, the agent this is a two-dimensional world. This is just a transition graph. And so this is not just a wall. For the agent, this transition from here to here does not exist. It's not part of its universe. Nevertheless, clearly the uh, compression algorithms has discovered that there's a coherence between these states. Now let's have a look what we what we actually optimizing. So we have again a goal influencing an action, of course, a state influencing action, and we extract a compressed G2 representation. So what are we doing? We again do a bottleneck, so a G2 compresses G in a form where the information that S keeps about A is retained. So what does it mean? It means that if we have a goal, given a goal, the state S is the most informative about the action. What this means is, say fix a goal, the goal is a location. Think of it as like, like a, a light, a, a lighthouse or something like that. And this location um, is somewhere. And basically by saying I want to keep this information between the state and S high, you say, I want my state to use the action as a pointer, as a compass towards the goal. Think of it as a local indicator of a global property. So actions are local, but the goal isn't global. In other words, I have a compass that turns something local, something global into something local, or converts or translates something local into something global. And, of course, that creates groups of directions. And, of course, in a larger world, this is a highly, informative, um, a highly informative thing to say. If I tell you, go north, you look at Polaris, the North Star. Okay, I'm sorry, you're in Melbourne, you can't. But if you can, right, if you can look at the North Star, you can go all the way to the North Pole straight. Assuming there are no clouds, you can go all the way through the North Pole. You don't need anything else to get there. So it is a highly informative thing to consider directions. Um, right. So I would like to use the remaining couple of minutes um, to discuss one uh, little idea that, um, again, is 
is a very um, uh, interesting application for information theory um, in, in uh, making predictions about evolution and cognition. So we discussed in the main, uh, in the main uh, keynote that um, when I have an agent and I want the agent to be better, so it becomes better, this is the effectiveness. So it, can't, it gets better, it needs information. If I squeeze the information, um, I want, I, I'm more parsimonious, so I want to squeeze information, then I'm faster, or can they make better use of my resources, or can use less in, um, energy on the long run, on the evolutionary run. And as long as I'm in this space, um, this gray area, where I can improve both efficiency and effectiveness, I both help each other. They are like two players. They, they, they improve their, their game. But once they reach a trade-off curve, and the one claim is that organisms are at the trade-off curve, so you can't improve the efficiency, so you can't make your information usage lower without actually lowering effectiveness, and vice versa. You can't increase effectiveness without increasing the cost of information. And so once at this trade-off curve, they become antagonistic players. So they collaborate until they get here, and then they become antagonistic. So how come that acceptation and adaptation actually do work? So um, I would like to em emphasize that if, if you are an actuator and you have too much information, so you have more information than you actually need, um, then there is an incentive for the actuators to actually use it or reduce the consumption, right? So either you st stop using the information and get lazy, or you must make use of it. You can't, it is, it's not a stable solution to just have the superfluous information and not end up acting on it. So there's an arms race. So when a sensor allows new behavior, the, then the policy will change to, to, uh, to, to make use of this behavior. And as this behavior changes, the sensor adapts. So either you move one way or the other, but at the end, you get stuck at this trade-off curve. So, we explained that already. And when we do that, uh, once we're at the trade-off curve, how do we move further on this curve? Well, it turns out that there is acceptation between niches. So for example, there are amphibians that here bang based on their lungs. There are rattlesnakes that have turned a skin sensor into an infrared sensor. And in other words, they have used one type of sensor in a totally different context. And there are others that have basically pushed the sensors to the absolute limit. The question is, why should that happen? There's no reason to do that. And here's the assumption. So let me just briefly explain how it works. So if we look at the core relevant information, the information that the action needs about the world to make you a decision, and you look a sensor that captures this information. So this is the information you want from where you get from the world. The sensor captures it, is, captures it, the action acts upon this, and you want essentially the sensor information to be just information that the action needs. While you want the information that the sensor has about the world to be minimal. Well, you look at this information optimal policy with an optimal sensor. Let's not worry about the details. I, I can discuss it in another, another opportunity. So we can ask, are there other tasks supported by the same sensor? So once you have a sensor optimized for one particular task, are there other tasks you can do with that? Because that means you are more adaptable and can do other things. Turns out that the alternative tasks that are available with original sensor and that are, say, performed at 95% performance level of the original task. When we sort them, it's just the dark line. Don't forget, forget the dashed line, that's not relevant. So essentially, you see the dark line, this is the optimal performance. Everything here is a performed essentially at near optimal performance. So there are lots of other tasks you can do at the same level of performance. And if you look at the tasks in our world, our world was just a grid world where you had to navigate, if you look at the performance in a world, it's very quick. You can travel through this world very quickly. It's very easy to travel from one goal to another, although we are constantly at the Pareto curve. Okay, So we can move through this world sideways 
with very little resistance. Now, I would like to um, uh, do now inclusive adaptation. Again, I'm rushing through it, I'm afraid, uh, because of the limited time. Just inclusive adaptation. So here, we, before we talked about goals that replace each other, now we talk goals that are added to previous goals. Again, we do the same thing, the same game. And we basically add a sensor for the new goal. I, I won't go through the details, but we add the sensor to the new goal. And we still keep try to keep the information that the sensor takes about the world to the minimum. So we add a goal a one after the other and try to keep it minimum. And if we look at the epochs when we when we evolve this, let's call it an evolution, turns out that it rapidly evolves to be to reach maximum resolution very, very fast. Maximum resolution. Although there was never the original goal to do to resolve everything. You get maximum resolution. You can actually very quickly get a sensor that can reach every goal in the world. Why is that? Well, is it an artifact of our experiments? Is this generic? What or do we just lucky in our experiments? Well, it turns out it was not the case. Well, we, we actually knew it was not the case, so, so the, the motivation is actually the other way around. That's why we did the experiments. If you look at the bottleneck information principle, we know that the information that the sensor gets about the world is larger than the information that the actuator needs about the world. Turns out it is often much larger. Factors, orders of magnitude sometimes. So this is what some people call predictive inefficiency, or as Susanna still calls us, users nostalgia in the context with of a past future uh, prediction. This is a waste information. And what we claim is that this waste information, we call it piggyback information. It comes with your sensor, whether you asked for it or not. But once it's there, it's available for use, right? It would be idiotic uh, for evolution not to use it if you can make use of it. You can res resolve this information. Yeah, well, then use it. Then use it for a shifting niche and essentially the drive to be maximal resolving, so having a maximum resolution, is now a result of making, uh, basically recruiting this piggyback information into service. So the way I like to think of it is you, you want actually only this, but you have to carry all this thing here around. So the piggyback is actually the thing you want. There's actually the payload. So you have a payload and together with the payload comes the whole bunch of stuff that's being carried with it. Um, and this encourages evolution to have a hollow of information that is available for use, available for further evolution, available to drive evolution into niche, available to refine your sensors to the limits. We see this refinement so often in nature that we can't just dismiss it as a fluke. And it's hard to believe that a toad really needs to identify individual photons, or that we really need to operate at the set, uh, level of thermal noise. I believe that there are information theoretic reasons why it is very easy, even without explicit selective pressure, to get a high development of sensory um, refinement. And possibly this is also an explanation for some phenomena in evolution of cognition. And I think with this, I uh, hand over to the question session. Perfect timing, Daniel. I was just about to jump in and uh, <laughs> remind you that we're getting close. Thank you very much. I'll give you the uh, the audible applause. All right. Um, so there actually aren't any questions in the uh, in the forum yet. So I'll lead off with uh, with a couple. Uh, those of you listening online, please feel free to to throw some in and. Uh, Probably be time for at least one more after I ask uh, Daniel a question. Uh, I have a few. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Screen what was that? I'm uh, still screen sharing or not? Um, you can leave it up if, if for the moment, so you can refer back to the slides um, if okay. you like. Right. But we we, we yeah. may not need to. Um, the first question that I wrote down for you is about. Uh, uh, the early section of the talk on PID and and you wrote about the tie to uh, to causality. Um, uh, you suggested that unique information might be the uh, the way forward there. 
Uh, but I wanted to, to kind of question that. I, I, I get the intuition that, you know, wanting an observational measure uh, uh, that would give you the, the closest match to causality, it's probably going to be unique information. But sh the question is, surely it, unique information is still observational. It's going to have all the same problems that come with observational measures. Uh, you know, they're, they're just not interventional. So um, have, I, have I missed something or uh, was that just unsaid? <laughs> um. Okay, I think this is just you know as I said, this talk is more speculative than my 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 main main talk. Um, so I permitted myself to actually think loudly yeah. um, because it's a, it's a, it's a it's a workshop. It's it's actually we work on this. So the idea is that if you want to trace information, and for causality, I would say this is something you want. You want to know where does this information come from? How does it go through the system? Does it come from here or does it come from there? Um, I would say in, unique information is probably uh, the thing you want, or some variant thereof. Of course, it doesn't have to be unique information over one variable. It might be unique information over a set of variables. So I'm not sure that unique information in one variable is the only thing you should look at. It's unique information about any combination of variables that may need to be looked at. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, you're completely right that, of course, if it's observation, it's observational, but still, unique information is a bit like how you say a dog tag, right? You can see where it is, right? Uh, so um, even if you don't know what the causality direction is, you can say, okay, this information is tracked here. So if I, if, if I have a, um, I color a river and I can't see the river flow, right? And I, I, I put some, some fluorescent color in the river, I can see, okay, it has flown this way. I may still not be able to trace the direction, but I can at least say what's, if, if I can't talk about downstream or upstream, I can at least talk about, okay, this is, this is where it's it spread. Plus, of course, you have other hints um, to trace causality in this case, namely time. Okay, time is a great, great friend. Some people even consider a time to be, um, or I, I, I personally think causality is essentially a generalized time. So if you have a causal basic network, essentially what you're having, you have multiple timelines, right? So, so essentially when you have time and unique information, I think it, it can help um, to, to uh, solve a lot of problems we have with causality. Mm -hmm. The big problem with, with things like uh, transfer entropy um, uh, the, is, is simply that it's very hard to say where does it actually come from, right? Transfer entropy. The problem with all these these observational measures is that they are kind of there's some observer on top of the system who does all the encoding decoding and everybody could in principle know everything and then you you find out okay if he knew that then he could do that so transfer entropy has a problem that you don't know whether it's a receiver that has a memory retained of the past or the, this memory has been sent again right so this is the problem why transfer entropy can't distinguish between causal flow and and, uh, and just predictive, right? You can't distinguish this. So what you want is something that tells you, no, I do not have this information at this stage, um, but I do have to have it now. And of course, unique information is probably closer to that thought than um, original cause, uh, original transfer entropy, mm -hmm. right? It's the whole point. The whole point of intervention is essentially to tell you, no, 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 you do not have this information. I make sure you don't have this information. I, yeah. I, I mess with you. But this information is, is gone. And uh, there's a good word. Neuroscience says lesions. That's exactly what you do. I, I destroy this information. Mm. You don't have it. Can you still perform? Mm. Right? So, so this is kind of my thinking. And unique information is a little bit sharper because it says this is information that I have and nobody else does. Now, mm. there are others in the line that have it, but it's then clear they are causally related. Yeah. Does it make sense? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, um, uh, yeah, I, I, I guess that's, a, that's a, a longer exposition of what I, I, I was kind of hinting at, I guess, that it, it, you know, it's still not completely there towards an intervention, but perhaps it's closer, uh, closer that, that, than you might have otherwise. Um, it's not an intervention, but it's it's distinguishing better what you know and what you don't. Mm -hmm. Perhaps we should actually talk um, separately offline 
and yep. actually discuss. Yeah, some- I'm gonna I'm gonna pull Mariam up onto the stage. She's our next speaker. While she's uh while she's coming online, uh, let me raise one very short question with you. Uh, there's still the problem, even for unique information. There's still the problem that none of us can agree on the right measure for uh, redundancy or unique information or synergy. Um, as a philosophical question, um, you know, you've raised some some points there on the way forward on uh um non-shannon entropies to sort of explore the space of, of of what the possible measure could be uh did you mean there that you think that might be where the measure everyone might agree on could be or were we more getting at this is an area we simply haven't looked at yet and it may shed some shed some light i think the fact that there are non shannonian inequalities should raise a lot of red flags that we are we are trying to uh, come up with some um, you know measures for 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 unique information redundancy and all these things that they are linear right often often the, the, the equations are linear and Möbius transformations are being discussed lattices are being discussed and um, I don't think you can do that um, you know it's groping in the dark but the people who do non general inequalities they understand a, a bit about the geometry of the space. Mm. Space has structure, and it's a non-trivial structure. So I feel that um, starting to marry these fields may be a way forward, yes. Mm. Okay, we should pro- looks like Daniel's frozen, uh, but we should probably leave it there anyway, because uh, we're definitely a bit over time. So I'm going to take Daniel down for the stage.